everyone. On today's podcast, we're going to talk with a returning EBB childbirth class graduate, Katie Kane, about an unexpected cesarean after an unmedicated first birth. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca Decker, pronouns she, her, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Today, we are so excited to welcome a returning EBB childbirth class parent, Katie Kane. Before we get started with the interview, I want to let you know that we will mention having an unplanned cesarean perinatal anxiety and postpartum anxiety, postpartum rage, and thoughts or fears of death. If there are any other detailed content or trigger warnings, we'll post them in the description or show notes that go along with this episode. And now I'd like to introduce our honored guest. Katie Kane, pronouns she, her, lives in New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia with her husband, two daughters, and a dog named Roscoe. Katie took the EBB childbirth class with instructor Kat LaPlante in spring of 2019 to prepare for her first daughter's birth. She shared that birth story, an unmedicated hospital birth, albeit after some problems with high blood pressure, on a previous EBB podcast, episode 127. Today, Katie is working as a high school counselor and is staying very busy with her young family. She enjoys reality television, spending time with her friends and family, and gardening. Katie is here today to share with us her second birth story, a cesarean that took place after pregnancy complications, and to talk with us about how her second time experience was different than her first, which was an unmedicated vaginal birth, and how Katie had to use all her research and self-advocacy skills. We're so thrilled to have Katie back as the first parent to be a repeat guest on the EBB podcast. Welcome back to the podcast, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. That's so exciting to be the first repeat guest from yeah. graduate. That's awesome. And I loved, you know, your first episode where you shared your birth story and your pregnancy story. And you, we talked a lot about high blood pressure mm-hmm. and we were able to like throw in a lot of evidence-based information. So if you're listening and you want to learn more about high blood pressure experiences during pregnancy, go back and listen to Katie's first story. But how was your pregnancy like this with the second experience? How did that compare to your first pregnancy? Was it different or the same or what was going on the second time? It was extremely different. I knew from the very beginning that this was going to be a very, very different pregnancy. So we got pregnant in July of 2020 and we had just decided that we were moving. We had put our house up for the market on the market and had put an offer in on a house actually on my oldest daughter's first birthday and her birthday is June 30th. And then we decided to stop preventing, but unlike with Lucy, we weren't really tracking or anything, but by July 21st, I was taking a pregnancy test and saw the faintest of faint lines. Um, and that was our daughter Cassidy. And just from very early on, Cassie made her presence known in my body. I started having pregnancy symptoms like a week before my missed period. And I felt like, I mean, it obviously wasn't her like kicking or anything, but I felt like a lot of movement, a lot of like pulsating and flutters very, very, very early on, like 10 or 12 weeks. Lucy was like a very, very mellow baby. She was head down starting at 20 weeks, which we'll talk about more was a big issue for Cassidy. One of the fun things about this pregnancy is we decided that we were going to wait till delivery to find out if we were having a boy or girl. Lucy, we did a whole gender reveal party. Really throughout the pregnancy, like I knew, I knew that this was going to be a very, very different pregnancy and delivery. And I don't, I don't know why it was just kind of like an intuition that I had with Lucy. Um, like you said, I had an unmedicated hospital delivery, had to use a lot of my advocacy skills for high blood pressure to avoid being induced. But honestly, the delivery was very textbook. I, I progressed beautifully, very few pushes. Like it just went extremely well. Use my doula, use the tub, use music. Like it was just a really beautiful delivery. And one of my biggest fears, the reason we went unmedicated with Lucy was because I have an extreme 
fear of not needles, but of like things in my spine, like epidurals. I had had a spinal tap in my twenties that resulted in a spinal headache. So I just had a huge fear of that. So that's why we really went unmedicated. And my biggest fear was having to get an epidural, having to get a C-section really because of that. And early on, I knew that this was going to be different. So we went for our 20 week scan and one of the complications that she had, which really my OB said is kind of the most common of complications is that she had a two vessel cord, which resulted in we had we were seen by uh, maternal fetal medicine just for growth scans and just to monitor that two vessel cord, which in the end really turned out not to be an issue for Cassidy. She was the issue with two vessel cords is the concern about if the baby is growing properly. And she was growing fine. She was a little bit smaller than my daughter. My daughter was nine pounds, five ounces at birth. And Cassidy was eight pounds, eight ounces. So she was a little bit tinier, but eight pounds is a great size for a baby. So, but we were, we were followed closely by maternal fetal medicine because of that. And just really at that 20 week scan, like they kept making comments like, Oh, she's in an odd position. She, you know, it's kind of hard to see parts of her. Like she's just in a really odd position. And I don't know what it was. Like, it was just such an off the cuff comment. There was no concern whatsoever about her positioning at that time. Like it's 20 weeks. There's no, the baby's moving all around, but that just kind of stuck with me. I always was like, "Mm, I I just have a feeling about this baby. I have a feeling about this delivery and I, her positioning is just really strange. So like I said, we were doing a lot of scans because of the two vessel cord and her growth. I had had previous high blood pressure, like you said, with Lucy, but I didn't have any blood pressure issues with Cassidy, which was wonderful. I was on baby aspirin since I think they have you start at 12 weeks. So I'm not sure if that ended up helping with the high blood pressure or if it was just a change in diet and activity, but no blood pressure issues with Cassidy. Normal, normal pregnancy things that a lot of moms say they experience in their second pregnancy, lots of fatigue, but you're also keeping up with a toddler, which contributes to that. But really at that point, at that 20 week scan, the two vessel cord was the only kind of complication. As you got towards the end of your pregnancy, what kind of things were happening? So I had been seeing my chiropractor. I started seeing my chiropractor who's um, certified in the Webster technique, which is kind of what you should always look for if you're going to be doing chiropractic care during pregnancy. And she's amazing. And I started seeing her probably around the 20 week mark, talking to her about my concerns with the baby's position. And so Cassidy was not head down until I went for a scan at maternal fetal medicine around 30, 31 weeks, right at the end of my 31st week. And she was finally head down, which was really exciting because she hadn't been head down since that point. And everyone really thought that, okay, she's head down, we're good to go, no issues. But then later that weekend, I remember like, my stomach completely changed. Like I was laying in bed and I felt this big movement. My stomach was kind of like protruding out. It was a completely different movement. I remember saying to my husband, does my stomach look different to you? And he was like, yeah, I guess a little. And I was like, I think that she flipped again. And I think that she's back to being head up. At that point, we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. But so I went in for my 32, right at the end of my 32 week appointment. And I said to my doctor, you know, I think that she flipped again. She was head down at my last ultrasound, but I think that she flipped again. And he was kind of like, and this is the oldest doctor in the practice. And he, he's just kind of like a legend. And he was like, that's really unlikely. Like, I don't think that she did. And he was feeling, but I'm heavier. So it is kind of harder for the doctors to palpate exactly where she is. So he ended up doing an ultrasound and sure enough, he was, he like did an ultrasound. He's like, yep, that's a butt. She flipped again. At that point, he really like reassured me. He's like, you're only at 33 weeks. Clearly if she's moving, she has room in there. Your fluid looks great. Cause that's one of the things that they're always monitoring with babies. If they're moving around, like if you don't have, if you have too much or too little fluid that can really complicate baby getting into the right position. So he really reassured me that if she was head down, she, she knows how to get head down. She should make her way back head down. There shouldn't be, you've, 
you've had a previous baby that was head down. We know that there's not a uterine complication that's keeping baby from going head down. She's been there before. At that point, though, I was like, I have this intuition. I think that something's something's up with her positioning. I really want to get proactive about this. We had also, we hired a doula who was amazing. And she was really there for me, emotionally supporting me, hearing my concerns, validating my concerns. Cause really like the data shows that like babies want to be head down only, I think it's a super small number, like three to 5% of babies end up being breached at delivery. So babies want to be head down. And Oh, that's what everyone was saying to me. She'll end up head down. Babies are supposed to go head down. That's what my doctors were saying to me. But she really helped me kind of start investigating, like, what can we do? So we did a lot of spinning babies. Spinning babies has this really nice guide that you can purchase. That's like a 20 page list of exercises that you can do. And it's a whole, like, I think it's a six week program that you can do if you find yourself late in pregnancy with a breech baby. So she purchased that for me and sent it over. I also went and started doing acupuncture. So I had done a round of acupuncture with Lucy to go into labor, but we started doing acupuncture earlier. I went back to the same acupuncture, which is South Philadelphia acupuncture. They're wonderful. And we started doing, um, moxibustion sticks, which is just little, they're like these black kind of like, they look like black crayons and you light them and you hold them at your pinky toe. And that's one of the things that the acupuncturist recommended. So we would do that multiple times a day, my husband and I, and then I was going into acu for acupuncture, I think twice a week and starting around like 34 weeks. So I went in for a, so I just wrote down my dates here. So at 35 weeks, I went in and she was still breech. And I, this was at my maternal fetal medicine appointment at this. And at this point I had kind of started asking around, like I was talking to different people that I knew from the birth world. I was still in touch with Kat talking a lot with my chiropractor, my doula, because like most areas, my practice won't deliver birth or breech babies. It's an automatic C-section. And I wasn't really, I had listened to a birth hour podcast about a woman who I think it was her fourth baby. And it just was a surprise breech baby. And she kind of went through great lengths in order to be able to have a breech delivery. And one of the things that she talked about that her provider talked about with her was, for a breach delivery to be successful, mom has to be like, mom's the one doing the pushing. Mom has to be confident. Mom has to feel safe doing that. Like mom, mom is the one making it happen. And at that point I really was, I was nervous about doing a breach delivery. I had done a lot of research and you have a great episode. I think it's like kind of an older episode. And I listened to that episode and not that it's just kind of like everyone says that breach deliveries are really scary. And, but, but that's not the, that's not the truth. I mean, there's a lot of great evidence that breach deliveries can happen and there's not necessarily like a ton of contradictions for breach deliveries. If you have the right provider, but my practice, it doesn't do, they don't do breach deliveries. So there's a hospital nearby that people were saying, like, if you're going to have a breach delivery, the likelihood of you having it in this area is at this hospital with this practice. And the way that my MFM works is that it's rotating doctors. So at my 35 week appointment, I actually had a provider from that hospital. And so I had a long conversation with him and, and they say that like, if you're going to have a breach delivery, you need to find an older provider because they're the ones that were actually trained in breach deliveries. They don't really train doctors in them now. And so I spoke with him and he said, you know, yeah, I do do breach deliveries. <sighs> he said that kind of the way that it would work though, is that you're really like, I could join his practice, but it's, it's doctors and it's whoever's on call is going to be the one delivering. And he said the likelihood of it working out that he was on call to do the breach delivery, you know, it's a one in 
seven chance or however many providers that they have. And he said there's not many providers in his practice that do do breach deliveries. And so it's kind of like when I go into labor, I would have to see if he was on call. And it just sound, that sounded extremely stressful to me. It's And also going to a hospital, I wouldn't be able to deliver at the hospital where I had Lucy. And I really did like, I like the hospital that we delivered at. And so that was running through my mind. So it, it was just a very, very, very difficult time. I was kind of preparing for the idea of having a cesarean birth, but then also had this in my, the back of my head that she could flip head down at any time. It's kind of like in my head, I was preparing for two different deliveries and I couldn't, I couldn't get comfortable. I couldn't find like a space where I felt confident and safe with planning for, for the delivery. It was, it was just a really, really challenging time. So I had that long conversation with him and he explained to me that at my next appointment, if she was still breach, that they would probably talk about an ECV and that he felt really confident that, that she would flip. And so at that point I, I decided that I was not going to try for a breach delivery if she was breach at the time, because the idea of having to find a new provider, switch hospitals, the chance that the, the doctor might not, the doctor that does breach deliveries might not be there for the delivery when I went into labor. And then also just kind of my fear of if I was going, if I was going to kind of have panic when I went in to deliver her. I wasn't confident that I would be able to overcome that. So went in at a 36 week appointment and she was head down. So everyone around me was so excited. My husband was so excited. My, did you feel your baby flip? I didn't or feel did it flip at that time. No, no, no. But she was head down and it was confirmed by ultrasound. I did not feel her flip that time. I was shocked when they said that she was head down. You know, my husband was relieved. My doula was so happy for us. The providers were happy, but I, I wasn't, I did not feel the relief I expected to feel. I hmm. still felt, felt this sense of gloom, like something wasn't going to go right. And so kind of in my head, I was like, something's not going to be right. Something's not going to go the way I want it to go with this delivery. And so when she was breech, I was like, that's going to be it. I'm going to have to have a C-section. This is what I've been feeling this whole time. This is what I've been feeling that's so different this whole time. And when she went head down, I was like, so what is it? Like if I'm feeling this feeling about this delivery and now she's head down, what's going to happen? And I really... I had a hard time. I thought that something else was going to happen at delivery. I thought that I was going to have maybe a postpartum hemorrhage. I thought that like a placental abruption, like it's like, it's so different with your second one. Cause you know, so much more like I was, I was so educated going into Lucy's delivery because of the EVB course. But then once you have your first baby, I feel like you come across, you know, so many other women's birth stories and, you just know a lot more, you know, a lot more that can happen. And I just had so many fears because I had this entire pregnancy. I had this, this feeling in my gut to the point where my doula came in. So she still had down at this point. So my doula was like, okay, let's, let's have our, our meeting, our final meeting where we're going to talk about delivery. And she comes to our house. She talks about all the comfort techniques that we can use. She talks, she gives us our Rebozo. She gives us our Tim's, what is it? The, the machine that you can put on your back? Ten, tens, tens machine. unit. Yeah. She mm-hmm. gives us our tens machine. She has her like 37 week meeting. And I just started crying during the meeting because she's talking about all these things. And I was like, this isn't going to happen. Like something is going to go wrong. Like I just feel like something's wrong and this isn't going to go the way that I want it. And I'm hoping that it will go. And I was really concerned at that point, like about my health, I was like, you know, worried something's going to happen. So that was a really difficult time. I was having a hard time. Like now looking back at it, I'm able to really like articulate it. But at the moment I couldn't explain what I was feeling. It sounds like you were having like 
a gut feeling or intuition that something was going to go wrong, but you also were being overwhelmed by anxiety yeah. about that intuition. Yeah. 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 Cause it's one thing to have an intuition that things won't go as planned, but it's another to be really kind of hyper aware of that and focused and anxious. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I even got to the point where I, I wrote my husband like a note, like if something had happened to me, I wrote him kind of like a goodbye letter, which sounds very morbid, but I had to really put it down. And I had to like, by writing it, it really kind of took like a weight off of me. And we also had contacted a lawyer, which we were planning on doing for a while, but I felt this urgency to get it done so that like our state stuff was in, in um, order, like that all of our health stuff was in order. So that happened the last month of our pregnancy. And then I was laying on the couch again at like right around my 37th, right at the end of my 37th week. And I felt like a huge movement. And I was like, I think she flipped, flipped back to head up. And so that 36 week, I was having a lot of Braxton Hicks. I was having a lot of, you know, pelvic pressure, just kind of things that you experienced in that last, last month as you're gearing up. But then when she flipped, I, it all stopped. So I went in for right at the end of my 37th week and I said, I think she flipped again. And they said, that's very unlikely, but we're happy to check. And they checked and sure enough, she was head up again. She was breech, which is very unusual for babies to be flipping this late in pregnancy. And she was, I had, I, I had a bunch of ultrasounds right at the end and she was in all kinds of different breech positions. She was in a complete breech, a frank breech. She was in an incomplete breech. At one point she was transverse. Like she, she had a lot of movement in there and, and we're really still not sure why. Uh, my fluids were always good. But at that point when she flipped back to head up, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to plan for a cesarean. I cannot, I cannot continue to think. I just need to plan for a cesarean. If she goes head down, that's great. I forgot to mention to back it up. We did talk about an ECV at, I guess we must have talked about it right the same time I talked with my maternal fetal medicine doctor. So the ECV procedure is where they try to like and flip the baby from the outside by, by pushing on your stomach and they oil you up. At my doctor's office, they do usually recommend giving you an epidural to do it, which I, I don't think everyone does that, but my provider does recommend doing an epidural. So we talked a lot about that. And this was before her, her last flip. And I just, so it's like kind of, it's a little bit higher than a 50, 50 chance of it working. And if it, if you've had a previous head down baby, your chances are a little bit higher. My maternal fetal medicine doctor did say, because I'm heavier, it might be a little bit harder to do just because he explained that like, you really need to feel where the baby is. And if you have extra fat, that it's um, a little bit harder to feel. I don't know if that's evidence-based or just his experience as a provider for many years. My doctors at my OB GYN were very on board with, with trying it. They thought that it was worth trying. My husband and I talked a lot about it. I talked a lot about it with our doula and I just really felt that if she wasn't staying head down, there was a reason she wasn't staying head down. And I, I just, I just decided against it really for, for that reason. And I didn't want to end up, I would rather have a planned cesarean than an emergency cesarean. So my fear was that something could go wrong with the ECV. And then we have a emergency cesarean versus having a planned cesarean. So, and I'm glad that we didn't end up doing it because my provider wanted to do, if she was still breech, they wanted to do it earlier. So I guess kind of there's two, two schools of thought that you either do it early around like the 37th week and then you, they, um, bind your belly. I, I guess I'm not sure what the exact term is, 
or you do it later, like your 39th week, and then you're induced at that point to make sure baby stays head down. My provider would have wanted to do it like 36, 37 weeks. And at that point she was still flipping. So I'm glad we decided not to do it. Mm -hmm. So now we're back up to like my 38th week. And at that point she was breech. I decided that we had to plan for a cesarean. We were still doing some spinning baby exercises I did stop going to acupuncture at that point, but we were doing the moxie sticks at home. So we decided to plan for a cesarean. And what happens is, is that my provider, they want you to have it as close to 39 weeks as possible, just so that you don't go into labor for a couple of reasons. They don't want you to go into labor because if the baby starts to descend, this is what my provider explained to me, that if the baby starts to descend, that it can be a little bit more traumatic if they have to then like pull the baby out, if it started to descend. And then also just like kind of logistics, like if you start going into labor, then it becomes a little bit emergent. It's not as calm as you would like it to be. So they called me, the scheduling office called me to schedule the cesarean and I asked to schedule it later in my 39th week, just for the off chance that she would flip back. I wanted to give her as much time as possible. So they scheduled it and we scheduled it. They told me the doctor that would be doing the cesarean because I'm in a practice of like eight doctors. And what I did was, is I then called up my doctor's office and I said, I would like an appointment with this doctor. She's doing my cesarean. I'd like to speak with her before doing the cesarean, which I'm really happy that I did. And I would really recommend that to anybody that's in a similar situation as my practice. So did you meet with your doula or like, did you do research on how to have a better experience with the cesarean? Yeah. So this whole time I was like in constant contact with Mallory, who's my doula. We were constantly texting. We were constantly, she's, she sends a lot of stuff, which is great. So her and I had had a long conversation. She said, so this was March of 2021 COVID restrictions at my hospital were in New Jersey. They doulas are considered medical personnel. So they don't count as one of your support people. So my hospital, you were allowed to have one support person and then your doula, which didn't count as a support person. So she would have been fine coming in for me before I went back to the operating room and then for post-op. And then she said, you know, she could come and stay with me even after delivery, if I wanted to. So she talked to me about that. And she said, she she said, you know, you can ask if I can be in the OR, I would be happy to be in the OR, I just don't think it would happen. So and then her and I had a lot of conversations about what we wanted, what I wanted the cesarean to look like. So I wanted to be able to um, play my own music. I wanted to have skin to skin in the OR. I wanted to, what were some of the other things that we did? Oh, clear drape. And I wanted just the doctors to like be aware of how nervous I was. And I really wanted to make sure that they were clear on kind of where I was at emotionally. So I got extremely, extremely lucky with the doctor that was doing the cesarean. She is she's extraordinary. She's very open-minded. She is, does not medicalize delivery unless necessary. Like she, she's, she's very, very wonderful. So I asked her, so I went in for this, for my appointment with, which was with her. And I wanted to talk about the cesarean. And I asked her, I said, could we have my doula in the room? And she said, yeah, sure. I don't see why not. Which I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) Like I was ready for this big, like, well, like kind of to give my, to advocate for myself, to give why I wanted this. And then she said, sure, why not? I just couldn't believe it. She said, the only thing she has to do is check with um, anesthesia to make sure they're okay with it, but she doesn't see a problem. So we talked about that. And then in that meeting, we talked about the other things that I wanted and she was super supportive. She was very understanding We talked a lot about the spinal tap for the cesarean. So when you have a planned cesarean, you don't actually get the epidural. The epidural is a tube that stays in and continues to give you the medication with a planned cesarean. 
you get a spinal tap. They just put in one injection of the medication. So nothing actually stays in. So she explained that to me. She explained the timing to me. She explained the recovery to me and told me what to expect, which I was really thrown by what to expect for the recovery. She said that I couldn't really pick up my daughter for four to six weeks. She talked about, you know, doing stairs, really only wanting to do stairs once a day if I had to, not driving for two weeks. So I was very, I was extremely anxious about the recovery. And I talked to my doula a lot about that, talked to my husband a lot about that. We're really fortunate in New Jersey that we have paid family medical leave. So my husband works in New Jersey. I don't. So I was on my school's like short-term disability plan, but my husband was actually able to take family medical leave to take care of me after my C-section. So we were extraordinarily fortunate in that from the state of New Jersey. So we get the C-section planned. My doctor actually called me like a few days after my appointment. She was like, Hey, I just want to let you know I'm at the hospital. I just talked to anesthesia. They're totally cool with your doula being there, which I thought was awesome that she called me. And she was just so kind and supportive, really understanding that this was so difficult for me. So at that point, Cassie ended up staying breached the whole time. Like I said, she flipped between Frank and complete, but she stayed breached the entire time. I had a couple more appointments after that to check So we were all set for the C-section. We had the C-section scheduled. It was an early morning C-section and it's kind of cool. So like my daughter was born, Lucy was born on June 30th at 39 weeks and five days. And then Cassie was born on March 30th at 39 weeks and five days. So I feel like there might be something there with the numbers. So yeah, my husband and I drove to the hospital that morning. We were still, uh, we still didn't know what we were having and we were still talking about names and he was, he wanted to do Cassidy and Cassidy is a Grateful Dead song. And so we were listening to that song on the way and just kind of, you know, talking, we got to the hospital, it was very calm, way different than when I was actively in labor with Lucy going into the hospital, just very calm. We went back, they take you back to your triage area. One thing I forgot to mention is they actually called me the night before a nurse from the labor and delivery calls you the night before. And she spent about 20 minutes on the phone with me, just talking about the logistics of the day talking about what time to get there, what to expect, talk to me about my doula, talk to me about any questions I had, which was a really, which which was really, really nice. So backing to the delivery day, we get to the hospital, my doula is there, my husband's there. We go back to triage. They just, you know, they get you set up, they get your IVs in, take your blood. They give you a couple medications. I think there was like, you know, I I asked her at the point, but it was, you know, I think there was like something for your stomach to kind of settle your stomach a little bit and just some other different medications before you go into the surgery. So then we're back in pre-op and they take, I went back to the operating room first to do the spinal. My doula and my husband weren't there for the spinal, which was really hard. The spinal was extremely difficult for me. Just some, my, my fear of things, needles in my back and the um, anesthesiologist was amazing. He was the attending. I mean, he was so caring and patient with me, but it would have helped to have your family. It would have helped. Yeah. It would have really helped. And I think if I had pushed more that it could have happened, but so even to the point where he was like, just feeling my back to see where to put in the needle. Like I started sobbing. It was, it was just really hard. So my doctor actually came over and was holding my hand, was talking to me was, and it was, it was really nice because I think one of the things that really overwhelmed me was when you're in, when you get a C-section there's a million people in the room and they're all preparing for their part of your delivery. Like there's, there's a mom nurse, there's a baby nurse, there's lots of people in there. And so it was like, everyone around me was like working and like doing their job. And I'm like sitting here having one of the most like difficult moments of this pregnancy. And when my doctor came over and started talking to me, the room really calmed down. And that's what I needed. I needed 
the room to stop moving and stop working. Like I needed everyone to really see that that I was having a very difficult moment. And it, and that's what it did when she came over, everyone really calmed down, which was nice. So the spinal is like, it's crazy. So he put it in, it was very smooth. Like the actual putting it in was fine, but you immediately like go numb and it's all the way up to your, your chest. Like you almost feel like you can't breathe, but you are breathing. It's, it's a very, very, crazy feeling. So then once the spinal's done, they immediately brought in my husband and my doula and everything moves really, really quick at that point. So I had listened to a lot of um, cesarean birth stories and was really prepared for some moms really experience like even though you're numb, they still feel like the tugging and the pooling and the pressure. I didn't feel any of that. And I was really surprised because I was kind of prepared for that. And the nice thing is, so my doctor was there doing the cesarean, but assisting her was the doctor that caught Lucy, which was pretty cool. Um, So she knew me really well. And it was like, that was a nice moment that she was there. I was happy to see her. And so they had the clear drape up and I sent some pictures of this. I'm not sure if they're too graphic for the website, but I really love these pictures. So they had the clear drape up, which they, I think it was like, they drop it after the baby comes out and they're holding her up and I'm like kind of putting my hand next to the drape. And then my, my doctor actually dropped the drape so that I could touch her as she was holding her up, which was really nice because it's just like for a mom to have to like touch her baby through a clear drape, the moment that they're in the world, like no one wants to do that. You want to hold your baby and you want them to be close to you. So the fact that she did that was just like, such a beautiful moment for me and really took away kind of the the pain of not having the vaginal delivery where she would have immediately been put on my chest. So yeah, at that point, we didn't know if she was a boy or a girl, but my, they held her up and my husband said, it's a girl. And I had thoughts that it was a girl kind of the entire time, but I was really happy that it was a girl. I think my husband, my husband was definitely hoping for a boy, but I think we're both happy to have two girls, especially so close in age. So it was a little bit of a back and forth with the labor and delivery nurse to be able to do skin and skin, skin to skin in the OR. So I had asked her before we went back for the surgery, if we could do skin to skin. And she kind of was like, not having it. She was like, oh, it's so cold in the OR. And this is the nurse. This is the nurse. Yeah. Okay. So my doctor had said we could do skin to skin. And so that's why I told her, I said, oh, the doctor said we could do skin to skin. And so she was, she wasn't really like super interested in facilitating that because it is like, they're trying to get you out of the OR. They're trying to get you back to recovery. So, and that takes time. And then the nurse, since you're all numb, like a nurse has to be Nearby. As I was say, it interrupts their normal exactly. way of doing things. Exactly, so it's, it's not really that much more inconvenient. It's yeah. just not what they're. It's used not to. what they're used to. Exactly. So we did do skin to skin, which was really nice, and to be able just to have her on my chest while they while they were kind of finishing up the surgery. It wasn't as long as I had hoped it had been, but my husband held her the rest of the time. And then one of the things that happens, so, you know, you're still open on the table. Like you're still having major surgery while everyone's in the room, while you're meeting your baby for the first time. So they're, they're sewing everything back up. One of the things I did ask her, I was like, did you see a reason why she would have been breached? Like, was her cord short? Was there a weird placenta placement? I did forget to mention I had an anterior placenta with Cassidy. I I didn't know if the placenta was in an odd spot, like keeping her. And she said, no, I, I didn't, I didn't see anything. Like we don't, I, I can't really tell you why she was breached or why she was flipping so much. I didn't see anything that stuck out to me. And that was hard. Like I kind of like wish there was this moment of like, Oh, that's why. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, okay, good. Good thing we didn't do the ECV because like, otherwise this would have happened. But They didn't see, they didn't see anything. Um, But I'm so glad I trusted my mom gut with that. Cause just cause they didn't see anything doesn't mean there wasn't something there or some other reason. So we are at postpartum and we're in the recovery room and everything, you know, we had the baby, everything was good. The rest of the surgery went 
Well, one thing that does happen, and I don't know if this is at every hospital, but when you have a cesarean, they have dad and baby leave the room and meet you in recovery while they kind of finish everything up. So like moving you from the operating table to your hospital bed, and then they have to put the the bind. They like put, There's like this big thing that wraps around you that to bind your belly. So they were putting that on, but they have like dad and baby leave for that part, which I was really, really happy my doula was there because otherwise I would have been alone in the operating room again. And she was there and she was able to talk with me and it would have been really hard if I was alone. Cause again, like, it's like people are around you doing their jobs and there wasn't really anybody else like paying, not paying attention to me, but like not Yeah. I don't know a better way to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Like focusing on getting me out of the room, getting the operating room turned over. So I was super glad that she was there. Yeah. So that was, that's how Cassidy came into the world. I can talk a little bit about recovery too. Yeah. How was your recovery? Cause I know it was something you were worried about. Yeah. So in the hospital, It was tough. I have a hard time with anesthesia. So I, like when I had my wisdom teeth out, I would get, I got really sick from anesthesia. And then I can't remember if I mentioned this in my last episode, but I had a, I have endometriosis and in my, when I was like 25, I had surgery for endometriosis and I actually had a misshapen uterus. It wasn't like a full bicornate uterus, but I had like a septum at the top of my uterus that they ended up removing during that surgery. And then they removed the endometriosis. And I got really sick from that surgery as well, just coming out of the anesthesia. Like my blood pressure drops really low. I get very nauseous. Funny enough, like, I don't know if anyone is going to go back and listen to the episode, but in my last episode, I said that I was going to, I was planning on for my next delivery, moving to a midwife practice and delivering at a birth center but I found out that I, I couldn't deliver at a birth center because they... Because of your history of yeah, surgery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they treated it like a VBAC. So that's why I ended up staying with that practice. So I got, I got again, the same thing happened. My blood pressure dropped really low. I was in recovery longer than expected. And I got really sick, really nauseous. I was throwing up from the anesthesia. And then I was like super itchy. So I've heard other women with C-sections talk about this, but like... I guess it's the medicine or something. Some people have a reaction to it. I was so itchy. Like I just kept having to like rub my face and like rub my nose. I was just extremely itchy. itchy. And then another thing that was happening, like when you're opened up, like gas and air gets trapped in there. And so it's, it's trying to get out and sometimes it travels up. And so like gas was traveling up into like my chest and my neck. And I just like almost felt like something like I was having a heart attack or something. It was extremely painful. Mm -hmm. So that was all while in the hospital. So because of COVID, like they used to keep C-section moms for three days, but now you can get out after two days. And so we got out after two days and we were home and the recovery was really long. I ended up doing pelvic floor physical therapy and it was just difficult. Like it, I just felt like the lower half of my body wasn't in sync and wasn't connected anymore to the upper half. I felt like it was really difficult to do things that were so common before I had the baby. Like before I had Cassidy, I would be able to like squat down at my toddler's eye level and talk to her. And like, I couldn't do that at all. And it was a long, I mean, it probably took close to like a full year. I'm about a year right now postpartum. And I would say it took close to 10, 11 months to really feel like my body was connected again. It was an extremely, extremely difficult postpartum experience for my body. I actually had like postpartum rage and postpartum anxiety after having Cassidy. And I experienced it a little bit with Lucy, but I ended up going and talking to my OB, but it wasn't until Cassidy was like 10 months old and ended up going on Zoloft, which has truly like changed the course of my life. I mean, it's been amazing. And just, I really wish I had talked to her sooner because I was trying to really white knuckle it for a long time. And Cassidy has some like some health issues, but, and I just was kind of like contributing it to the stress of that. But 
I'm so glad that I did that. Like it was just, it was, and my provider was amazing about it. And just, it just, I truly like had a chemical imbalance and like just needed it. Like it, and it's been, it's been absolutely wonderful. Yeah. So Cassie had like, so she had a tongue and lip tie, which made breastfeeding extremely difficult. So I was, I pumped for a while probably until she was six or seven months old. And she just, she's just such a different kid. Like she had RSV and was in the hospital for a couple days. And she actually has this thing called F pies, which is where she, she can't eat bananas. Like when she eats bananas, she ends up throwing up for like days on end, which was really hard to figure out because most baby foods have bananas in it because it's a thickening agent. And that's like one of the first foods most people give babies. Luckily, my pediatrician had experienced it before, so she knew it right away. But it was just like a really, she had chronic ear infections. She just had ear tubes in. So it just was like a really difficult like postpartum year. And we're just kind of coming out on the other side at this point. But it, it's definitely been a lot, a lot better uh, now that she's past that year mark and everyone's taking care of themselves. Yeah. And I think, you know, you raised a good point talking about the you know, it sounds like you had perinatal anxiety, like oh yeah, anxiety during pregnancy and, you know, postpartum either. You can have it at any of those time points and like the importance of talking with your healthcare mm-hmm. provider and your support team about that and getting treatment if needed, because in general, things like anxiety don't tend to just go away. Yeah. Like you have to do something to address it. Yeah. 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 And I think as moms, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves like to... <sighs> do things for our kids, make life good for our kids. And there's definitely can be like a stigma with medication. But since I went on Zoloft and started talking about it, like a lot of women I know are on some sort of medication and our bodies have been through so much. Like our bodies have been through, I mean, in the last, since October of 2019, you know, I've been pregnant, breastfeeding or postpartum for, you know, that's a long time. And that's a lot of Mm. hormonal changes in your body and life changes. And, and then we just, you know, sometimes we don't take care of ourselves as well as we take care of our kids. And we really should because we're the, we're the best things for our kids and we got to be here and we got to be the best versions of ourselves. And I think that's a hard thing to realize that it, to swallow the fact that you can't be the best version of yourself without medication, I think is a difficult thing for women to think about, but it's been life changing. It's really, really has been life changing. I probably should have gone on it after I had Lucy and stayed on it while I was pregnant with Cassidy. Cause just some of the thoughts I was having with Cassidy were just like the thoughts that I was going to die that I would, mm-hmm. you know, those, those I should, should have had under control. Yeah. You were having severe anxiety yeah. symptoms, it sounds like. Yeah, for sure. Was there anything from taking the EBB childbirth class for your first birth that you felt like really helped you the second time around? Yeah. I mean, I think I definitely used my EBB skills much more than I did with Lucy just because I had to. I mean, the fact that I was even able to have all these conversations with my providers and advocate for myself, like that came from the EBB course. And the fact, like just with the resources that you offer in terms of under, like, cause I think that for women, like looking at research can be so overwhelming, but just the quick, like sh- EBB articles that are offered that really synthesize everything and have up-to-date research are life-changing. Some like, I mean, I I know that you have articles on, and I, like I mentioned, you have the podcast on Mm -hmm. breach deliveries. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we had this pregnancy was I was GBS positive and I wasn't with Lucy. So when I thought I was having a vaginal delivery, we started talking about that and looking at the research for that. And then another thing, after I had Lucy, I had my hospital's like standard procedure is to give Pitocin after delivery. And I had long conversations with my doula about that just because it was really inconvenient. Like I was hooked up to an IV for almost 12 hours after delivery and it just didn't feel necessary. So, and I was able to talk with my doctor about that and come up with a different plan for if I had had a vaginal delivery. I can't remember. 
if I was on Pitocin after Cassidy, to be honest, I can't. It sounds like it was a little bit of a blur. For yeah, you, I can't like remember how long I had an IV in, but I remember with Lucy, like it was really annoying to still have an IV in after because I didn't even have. I just had the Hep block during delivery with Lucy, and then I was hooked up to an IV after delivery. It just didn't really like compete mm-hmm. with me. So that was very helpful to be able to research those articles and just like the network that I was able to create. Like I still kept in touch with Kat. Kat actually recommended Mallory to me, who was my doula, knowing to go to a chiropractor, knowing to go to acupuncture. Also, like there is a section in the EBB course about planning for a cesarean. So Mm -hmm. I was able to like advocating to have my doula there, advocating to have my own music playing in the OR. And I think that one thing we talked about in our EVB course was making sure that like to set the tone for the OR. So like the idea of having everyone introduce themselves to you and explain their role to you, that didn't necessarily happen at my delivery, but that's something that would have been helpful at my delivery. And I think with Lucy, like I put the idea of having a cesarean out of my mind. Like I, I didn't want to think that it would happen, but we did talk about it in the EBB course because it is something that can happen with delivery. And Mm -hmm. just the idea of knowing that there are times you have to have cesareans and there are times that they are medically necessary and being at peace with that and knowing that it's not your body failing It's not anything wrong with you or your baby. It's just what your baby needed to come into the world. And honestly, like the EBB course helps you avoid the cascade of interventions, but I don't think that that's not what happened with Cassidy. It just was, you know, she was one of those three to 5% of babies that were breached. And of course we could have a bigger conversation about not having vaginal breach deliveries in this part of the country, but I wasn't willing to like, I wasn't willing to like negotiate having like, I didn't want to go that route of. No, it sounds like for your anxiety, yeah. the need to have kind of like a plan that yes. wasn't constantly changing yes. was really important for your mental health. Yep. So yep. it sounds like you made the decision that was most empowering for you and for healthy sure. for you. For sure. Yeah. And we really appreciate you coming to share your story, Katie. I wanted to point out, you know, you mentioned a couple podcast episodes. Dr. Elliot Berlin came on episode 111 to talk about breach pregnancies from the chiropractor. And then we have a a mini breach series that we did episodes 171, 172, and 173. We have a vaginal breach birth story. We talk about the evidence on ECV for turning breach babies. And then we have Dr. Freeze and Dr. Hayes come talk about the evidence on breach birth. So I encourage our listeners who are experiencing a breach birth to make sure you check out that mini series. But Katie, thank you so much for sharing your story. And, you know, it was really a delight to hear from you and that your advocacy skills still came into play, even with a very different pregnancy and birth. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for all the work that you do. We really appreciate it. 